Indian agriculture goes back a long way. As governor of the Farm Credit Administration, he becomes responsible for this independent federal agency. It supervises the nationwide farm-owned farm credit system. Now it makes loans to farmers and ranchers and also to their cooperatives. Now this is important because most of us are affiliated with the federal land bank system and Don makes funds available to that system and also to the federal intermediate credit bank which is our PCA system and also to the bank of cooperatives which many of us are affiliated with. Most of us, many of us borrow money from some of those sources. He became governor in 1977. He was also the administrator of the Agriculture Marketing Service, which is a segment of the Department of Agriculture. He served as six years as Secretary of Agriculture for the state of Wisconsin. He has a degree in economics and agriculture. He graduated from the University of Wisconsin at Madison and he has a joint ownership with a brother on a family farm of over 500 acres. Well, he served during World War II. Uh, just happens that he was a pilot on the B-29 Flying Fortress during World War II and had combat duty in the Pacific Theater. And it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you my friend and a friend of NFOs and yours, Don Wilkinson, Governor of Farm Credit. Thank you, friend Devon Woodland. Delegates and friends of this important conference, your 80, 1983 National Convention of NFO, let me tell you why I am pleased to be here and why I am impressed with the fact that Devon remembered some of the things I had used in introducing him to some very important people worldwide. First of all, you do not serve <clears throat> as Secretary of Agriculture in the state of Wisconsin without having a lot of knowledge regarding NFO. <laughs> Secondly, you do not take that, you do not get that knowledge from just reading the press, especially when you've got a friend like Steve Pavich who frequents your office frequently as Steve did in those good days. And then thirdly, ladies and gentlemen, you do not serve as Secretary of Agriculture in Wisconsin without being accountable to your State Board of Agriculture. Sure, you're on the governor's cabinet. In fact, like Chuck Frazier, I served under a Democratic and under a Republican governor. Nobody's ever been able to understand it unless you know the State Board of Agriculture structure in Wisconsin. And you do not serve as Secretary without knowing a lot about NFO when you've got a Jim Rundy and a Ken Schmidt NFO delegates serving on that State Board of Agriculture, as I did. Now, Devon, do you know why I know quite a bit about this good organization and why I'm so pleased to be here today? And there's another reason why I'm pleased to be here. And I'm respectful of your time, and I can see some of you that are even rubbing your stomachs, and it's not because you're overly filled either. But NFO and the farm credit system which you own, that is if there may not be a borrower, is there anyone in here that uses credit? <laughs> ha! Well, I suspect I could ask for hands to be raised and there are a lot of owners of the farm credit system because it is a cooperative structure as Devon has indicated. Uh, NFO and the farm credit system have done some very important things together and that's why I'm pleased to follow Chuck Frazier because we are close in Washington. What Devon has indicated regarding the ability of your Washington representatives, both Chuck and Joanne, is certainly true. I see it because we happen to be housed in the same buildings. I see it because I can watch how he functions in the halls of Congress. And we're in a position to know who is effective and who isn't, and what you heard is exactly right. I saw it, ladies and gentlemen, in 1980, when your farm credit system went to Congress asking for broader authority, permitting funding of the cooperatives so that they could get involved in exporting grain and being e e involved in the international arena. 
NFO supported that legislation. And I've seen it more recently in a very important area because of an individual whose name has already been mentioned here, David Stockman, Director of Office of Management and Budget. That office, for some reason, seems to think that the farm credit system is too competitive in the national money market with the U.S. Treasury. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a tribute to the American farmer. <clears throat> Dave, Dave Stockman and his people refer to it as agency status. That means that the Congress over many years have granted the farm credit system the opportunity to go to the money market and secure 80 to 100 billion dollars a year to make possible the, the credit that you need and not use one cent of tax dollar. And that's what I'm so proud of. But they claim that we are so big and we are so aggressive and we have such an outstanding record that our rates for securing those securities in the money market are just too competitive with the Treasury's own notes. Well, NFO has constantly been in there supporting the continuation of the agency status, the ability to go to the money market. And the raising of money in these amounts and the making and collecting of loans in these times is not all easy. It's a tough economic environment, and I want to spend a few minutes talking about that. I'm going to talk about it in three ways, very rapidly. One is the general economy, and Chuck has already given us a beautiful introduction to that. The second, the ag economy, and Roger had some good points in there. I won't nail them all down, I'll just touch on some of them. And then the third thing I want to talk about is you. The economic condition of the farmers and ranchers that are serving American agriculture today. Now, it's important that you remember something that Devon said a moment ago because you are not looking at an administration spokesman when you look at me. As Devon has indicated, I head up, as governor, the independent agency known as the Farm Credit Administration, not part of the U.S. Department of Ag, not part of the Treasury. It supervises the privately owned farm credit system. That's its sole job, a big job, examination, regulation, supervision. One of the best things is I am accountable to a board of farmers, a board of 13 people, 12 of whom are appointed by the president with staggering terms, so similar to what I had in Wisconsin. I mention this and remind you that I am not here espousing the Republican philosophy or the Democratic philosophy. I'm here expressing concern and ideas regarding the economy in which we live in. Now we've, we've heard a lot of talk about the general economy of the United States. The word debt has been used several times. Do you realize that we are a nation deeply in debt? Deeply in debt. We have to recognize that our problems, while not as severe as some of our neighbors, are still of concern financial problems of Mexico, Brazil, some of the third world countries. But this nation, the United States of America, ladies and gentlemen, happens to be in debt to the tune of $1.4 trillion. That's bigger than the budget of NFO. <laughs> Is that right? Did I yeah. miss that? <laughs> oh, all right. I didn't want to misspeak here. And that, that $1.4 trillion, and that's hard to understand, is growing larger all the time. In fact, if you followed the press within the last two weeks in the closing days of Congress, they increased the debt ceiling up to $1.49 trillion. Let me restate that for some of us who can't talk in terms of trillions. That is $1,490 billion. All right, keep that figure in mind. As Roger says, if you want to write it down, it might help. Ladies and gentlemen, the debt of the United States back in 1975 was $544 billion. 
Notice the dramatic jump. Now, let me try to put billions into perspectives. I think maybe only the people at this side of the table know what we're talking about, billions and trillions of dollars. This is the elite group up here, is it, Devon? Yeah. All right. A billion seconds ago, ladies and gentlemen, Harry Truman was president. A billion minutes ago, minutes, was just after the time of Christ. A billion hours ago, man had not yet even walked on this earth. A billion hours ago. A billion dollars ago was yesterday afternoon in the treasury. <laughs> As a former U.S. Senator, Everett Dirksen from Illinois put it, a billion here and a billion there, and pretty soon you're talking about real money. <laughs> well, we are talking about real money, and we're talking about real debt. And the debt is causing huge deficits, resulting in unbelievable negative cash flow for this country. No farmer, no businessman, no industrialist can long survive on a negative cash flow. And that's what Chuck was saying, too. And yet we as stockholders don't seem to get excited about it. We sit back and watch the largest business, the largest business in the world, passively get deeper and deeper into debt. And you know what would happen to you if that should take place on your own farm operation. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1969, we had no deficit, no federal deficit, as recently as 69. We even had a surplus of 3.2 billion. This year, 14 years later, as has been indicated, the deficit will run 210 billion. And the deficit alone will be $25 billion more than the entire budget was back in 1969. Things have really grown, haven't they? And if that isn't a cause for concern, consider that the interest on the national debt is now nearing $100 billion a year. That's over half of the U.S. budget just 14 years ago. That's the interest alone. These are things I think we should be concerned about. As a New York Congressman, Roger Conable, Barbara Conable said, the deficit, and I'm quoting him now, the deficit is a monster with hobnailed boots grinding down on the neck of the prostrate American economy, end of quote. That's powerful language, but that's exactly what it is. It's strangulating the American economy. Thomas Jefferson said somewhat the same thing in a little different kind of language nearly 200 years ago when he said, and I quote, the principle of spending money to be paid by posterity under the name of funding is but swindling futurity on a large scale. End of Jefferson's quote. Well, I don't come here to be an alarmist. But I'm trying to build a case against a, f a mounting federal deficit, as Chuck mentioned, and the continuous borrowing to finance it. Borrowing that is keeping the interest rates you have to pay in double digits. And that's my business, and that concerns me. <clears throat> there are only two ways of keeping that monster from growing, and I wish Chuck had given me the solution. The first is to reduce the federal spending, and the second is to increase taxes. And he told you exactly who's on what sides of that issue. If you chose to try and reduce the deficit by the taxation route, let me shock you. Every taxpayer would have to be taxed this year at 73% of your income to achieve a balance, that is, to eliminate the deficit. That is shocking. Every taxpayer, so you know darn well we're not going to eliminate the deficit in this year, next year, or for a long time. Well, I hope I've shocked you about the general economy. I don't think I've told you anything you didn't know, but as, as stockholders in our government, I think we have to be concerned. Let me go to the second point, and that is the economic situation in the agricultural sector, and you're living this every day. Roger, Roger cast that one beautifully by saying, by comparing the, the escalation of farm debt 
and I'll go back to 75 where it was $81 billion, and today, as was indicated, $220 billion. Interest on that debt today is $22 billion, just to finance the credit needed by American agriculture. And there are those who will cite the escalation in land values during that period as an offsetting factor, and who will point out that the debt to asset ratio of farmers has not changed all that much. Haven't you read some of that? The debt to asset ratio has not changed. The American farmer's not suffering that badly. And they'll tell you that farmers still have $20 in debts for every $100 in assets. Well, that may be true as far as it goes, but let's set this record straight. It doesn't go far enough because those figures encompass all farmers, including those who have no debt, and there are some. They may be landlords, they may be elderly, they may have made it by marriage. I wish I had enough sense to have done that. <clears throat> I can see others are wishing the same thing here with that, <laughs> that nasty laugh. But if we go into the real world, we find that between January of 81 and January of 83, only two years, land assets declined $55 billion, land assets down, and debt increased $34 billion. And even if you add a $14 billion gain on in other assets, we still come out with a loss in farm equity in two years of $75 billion. Some of you from the upper Midwest may have seen the University of Minnesota study, just conducted showing that the average value of one acre of farmland declined $131 in just 180 days in the state of Minnesota. 103,000 farm families in the state of Minnesota had to absorb nearly $4 billion in equity and collateral in one in that state alone. I don't think we have come to realize what's happening across this country yet because there isn't that much land moving. Well, enough then on the debt to asset ratio. I hope I've blown that bubble a bit. Now let's take a look at government programs because that has already been mentioned. And that is a problem that I'm concerned with as well. They have had a significant effect on the economic condition of agriculture. Direct payments, direct payments now to farmers have gone from 800 million back in 1975 to over 12 billion this year, direct payments. And then if you add to that the activities of the Commodity Credit Corporation, which is in the budget, you have an overall program cost of $22 billion. Now, if you want to really lose some sleep tonight, <clears throat> do this. Divide that $22 billion by the number of farms as defined by USDA. Well, I don't want you losing any sleep. I'll tell you what the answer is. You come up with an average of $10,000 per farm. $10,000 per farm, per farm. Now, the thing that bothers me is this. Tell the unemployed auto or steel worker in Detroit that every farmer in the United States will get an average of $10,000 and then ask yourself how long and to what extent do you think that steel worker is going to vote for his congressman to support that kind of a program? Watch what impact this may have as we go into the development of a new 1985 farm bill. I was watching it carefully as to whether the president was going to show this particular side of the issue in vetoing the dairy legislation, and I'm thank full that he did not, because it would not, it's not a good bill, but it's better than some of the alternatives. I mentioned this, this direct spending, because there are going to be changes taking place. And I am not here to say agriculture is getting more than its share. I do not mean to imply that. What I do say is that it is far more visible. It is far more visible than that being received by you name it, the airlines, the transportation corporations, and so forth. 
The Chrysler loan guarantee, for example, did cause quite a stir at the time. And there, Lee Iacocca decided, well, it's so visible, let me take advantage of it. Now he's one of the best advertisers in the TV business. And if you noticed, he took advantage by repaying a major part of it as rapidly as possible. <clears throat> well, $22 billion seems to be a magic figure in, a, in the government and in agriculture. It is the interest rate on our farm debt, and I've mentioned that. It is the estimated cost of this year's farm programs. And incidentally, if you don't remember, it was the net farm income for farmers in 1982. And make of that what you will, I don't know, $22 billion. So we've got farmers burdened by the general economy, affected by the agricultural economy, with its increasing debt, high interest rates, low commodity prices, uncertainty of the export markets, and then this crazy weather that we live with from drought to floods and everything else in this country. We also have the prospects, ladies and gentlemen, of a dramatic change in government policy, which will first, I think, show up in the farm bill. I had an indication of this as I sat in the machine shed only a month or six weeks ago on Jack Block's farm. And it was a working machine shed. Our shoes got good and dirty and dusty, and that's fine. The important thing was not only was Jack Block there, so too was the vice president. And together, they talked about some of the policies that are going to have to change as they work on this new legislation. Enough then on, first, the general economy, secondly, the agricultural economy. Let me get down then to the third point and look at the farmer today. How is he, is he coping? And you can analyze your own situation. And with that, I saw some frowns come across your face. You know what your own position is. Let me speak about it with a little broader collective input of some one million farmers who are the owners and the borrowers from your cooperative farm credit system, a system providing one third of all of the farm debt today. One third. There's no question that many farmers are facing stress, some to the breaking point, and you can think of them, and you know some of them, and they worry me. But frankly, I'll have to tell you that the vast majority of the farmers who are borrowing from the farm credit system are meeting their commitments. They are straining, they are struggling, but they are meeting their commitments. The federal land banks, of course, with the long-term real estate lending, are running about 3% delinquencies, 3%. Now, let me give you a contrast. If you go into the housing industry, the Mortgage Bankers Association report that nearly 6% of all home mortgages are delinquent. Not bad for the farmers who are borrowing from our system. Let's get to the production credit with the PCAs. There we find 3.7%, and this was mid-year, of their loans to be delinquent. Compare that with the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which of course backs the commercial banks. They say about 5% of all of their loans to U.S. banks are in arrears. 5% of the farm of the borrowers of their banks. Out of over one million borrowers, as I've indicated, we have 8,656 farm credit system borrowers in serious trouble. You want a percentage on that one? 0.008% fall into the serious category. Well, these are difficult times. These are times which the farm credit system has not faced since the Depression days. There are major losses taking place. They are well within control. They in no way need to be of concern to the investor. But the losses this year are the largest the system has ever had to absorb. We have tried to make sure, ladies and gentlemen, that the farm credit loan officers, those who have the privilege, the responsibility, of working with our borrowers day in and day out on a one-to-one -one basis, 
are going to do everything they can to try and get that borrower through troubled times. Our federal board is on record with a forbearance policy. We have urged our loan officers to use every tool in the book, and many of them have gone through the finest of universities and ag econ courses, and the tools they're using today were never taught to them. They're learning the hard way. It may be simply skipping a payment. You see it's the marvelous thing when you own a system. You can adjust some of your rules. It may be paying interest only. It may be refinancing, reamortizing, selling assets. Well, let me make just finally a few specific points because there may be one or two of you out there who think you're going to make it through to the end of the year, and so help me, I hope you will. But then you're going to be going in front of that loan officer somewhere early next year. I hope you are successful. A lender, however, a lender does a borrower no good by continuing to provide credit when it is only causing further erosion of equity. And that's a very difficult thing for a farmer, especially some of us who've grown up and love the farm, very difficult to accept. This lender, your PCA, for example, has to also keep in mind that it obtains loan funds through the sale of securities, not from the government, not from your tax dollar. Those who invest in our securities, who make possible your credit, expect to be repaid on time and with interest. The reputation of this system in the money markets is excellent. It must be maintained. An investor in our entire history has never lost one cent of interest or principal in that investment. It doesn't mean there aren't major losses, both by borrowers as well as institutions, but the system builds for those terribly rainy days, and we are in them now. I think it's well, too, to remember that the farm credit institutions are cooperatives. One editorial writer explained this idea well not too long ago. It seems, as he say, stated in his article, a PCA had unfortunately the necessity of foreclosing on a farmer. It had financed the down payment on some land, but it never received anything more than the interest and not much of that. And the writer pointed out that the farmer was paying pretty cheap rent when you look at it that way. But this is the important point. He also pointed out that he didn't have much sympathy for that farmer. Why? Because his real sympathy had to be for the other 249 farmers who were the stockholders in that very PCA and who would have had to absorb the loss. And that's exactly what some of the situations are today. Now you may have read in some publications that certain PCAs have been tightening up on credit and that it may be a betrayal to farmers. I hope that they have not betrayed. But you see, tightening up means that they're trying to protect that very institution which the farmers are a member of. They, the, a PCA has to face cash flow just the same as the borrower. And probably the situation is they should have been tightening up earlier if that's the situation. It's not good news, but I have to tell you that there are four PCAs who are facing, which are facing liquidation. There are others being merged. The system is large. It can absorb these kinds of situations. The farm credit system has gone the extra mile. Well, the meaning of all of this to you, and the reason I'm here, the reason I was privileged to accept Devon's invitation, is number one. I'm here to say to you, there will be credit available next year. This system has always been able to get the credit it needs. Don't ask me what it's going to cost. I hope that it's not much different than right now. I see a stable kind of environment, but I don't want to be held to that when I see Steve Pavich a year from now and he's had to pay a quarter of a percent more. I'm sorry, Steve, you paid off long ago. I'm here also to emphasize 
that as you work with the lender, retain a proper relationship. Don't turn them off, her off, whoever it may be. Communicate. The lender has the right to see good records, a good plan of operation, evidence that you can run your business, you've got discipline, evidence that there is cash flow. And then you have a right to get the full attention of that lender, to obtain counsel, to get the best loan package you can negotiate. And that's where I think the PCAs and the land banks have the advantage because they have professional loan officers. And yet I will also say we need the commercial banks and others in there as well. Well, in 1984, we'll be living in an economy that I hope will continue to show at least the general economy some significant improvement. But I would have to remind you that history indicates that as the general economy improves, unfortunately the agricultural economy lags behind several months.